Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about the solved case of Sharon Carr. She was just 12 years old when she carried out the brutal murder of a young woman and she was only caught and apprehended while she was in the process of trying to claim her second victim. Sharon Carr was dubbed the devil's daughter by the media and as of today she is the youngest female murderer in British history. This case is such an interesting one. It's one that's been requested to me so many times by you guys in the comments and in my DMs so I really 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 look forward to hearing your thoughts on this case. But quickly before we get into the case, I would just like to say a huge thank you to Hunt a Killer for very kindly sponsoring this section of the video. Now, if you are like me and you just love anything a bit spooky, you like thrillers or horrors, crime, then listen up because you will love this. Hunt a Killer is a murder mystery game where you have to play detective, but the best thing about it is that you can do it from the comfort of your own home. When you sign up to Hunt a Killer, they will send you you your own murder mystery box and you have to use the items inside the box to try and solve the crime. You have to sort through the evidence and piece together clues to narrow down the suspect list and figure out who the killer is. You'll have to go through case files and puzzles and ciphers. It's such an enjoyable and immersive experience. You really get invested in the story. There are so many different game styles and themes to choose from. You can get standalone single part mysteries, multi-part crime cases, and they even have exclusive subscription memberships. They have monthly subscriptions and also a six month subscription option and 12 month subscription too. There are so many different storylines as well as difficulty levels. So you can start off with a case that is a little easier to crack. And then as you get better and better and better, you can choose boxes that are more difficult as your skill level will have improved. Think of Hunter Killer as being like your very own CSI episode combined with an escape room. Room. It's a lot of fun to do solo, you can give it a go on your own, or it would be so much fun to do with friends or family. It's a great game night or date night activity because you can work together to try and solve the mystery. Right now I've got the Dead Below Deck box and I'm currently trying to solve the murder of stewardess Rachel Vainson who was killed aboard the Old Thunder yacht. No spoilers if you've already done this one before please. So if you would like to check out Hunter Killer for yourself then head to www.hunterkiller.com forward slash molly and use the code molly hunt to get ten dollars off of your order of great murder mystery games today again thank you so much to hunter killer for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel thank you to you guys for always supporting the sponsors on this channel and now let's just get into the case just before we continue please listen carefully to the following this video is about the murder of a young woman and involves heavy themes such as violence towards women sexual assault child abuse and neglect domestic abuse, animal cruelty, self-harm and mental health issues. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case we are going back to the late 70s to 1979 and our case begins in Belize which is a country located on the eastern coast of Central America. That is where Sharon Louise Carr was born. She was born on the 21st of December 1979 and she was one of four children. She had three siblings. According to reports Sharon Sharon's biological father was never really in the picture. Apparently he was an alcoholic and when he was drunk he could be violent and abusive so he didn't really have any involvement in Sharon's life and the Carr family were very poor. They really didn't have much money. They lived in an area where there was a lot of poverty. However when Sharon was around like six seven years old in 1986 the family actually picked up and they moved countries. They decided to move from Belize in America America all the way to a town called Camberley which is in Surrey in England and as I understand it the main reason for this move was because Sharon's mother met and began a relationship with a man from England and so she wanted to move to England so that she could be with him so obviously her kids moved with her too and now the kids Sharon had a stepfather and at first this move seemed to be going really really well for the family young Sharon seemed to be adjusting really well to 
to this new life. Obviously she started at a new school where she seemed to be thriving. She got involved in different school activities and sports. She particularly enjoyed playing basketball. She was very polite and well-mannered towards teachers. They described her as being helpful and honestly charming. She seemed like a lovely young girl. But then over time her character just started to change drastically. As I just said, when they first moved to Surrey and Sharon started at the new school, she was a very happy student who had a lot of promise and potential. But gradually, Sharon Carr started to change. She turned into the complete opposite. She started to become quite short-tempered. It wouldn't take much for her to snap and become quite aggressive. She started misbehaving in school, picking on other kids. She would become violent towards other students. And we can guess that the main reason for this was because because this was basically the kind of behaviour that she was witnessing at home. Her mother was similar to Sharon in that she was very quick to anger. She was very feisty and volatile. She was physically abusive towards her children to Sharon and also her partner, Sharon's stepfather. In fact, on one occasion during an argument where her boyfriend tried to split up with her, Sharon's mother got so angry, she was so furious with him that she poured boiling hot fat over his body. She wanted to make him suffer and of course he did. The burns from this fat would have been excruciatingly painful. He was treated in the hospital for these injuries and Sharon's mother was arrested and charged with assault. But what's even more terrifying about this attack is that Sharon's stepfather recalled how whilst it was happening, whilst his partner was pouring this boiling fat over his body, he remembered looking over to Sharon who was still so young. I believe she was still under 10 years old when this happened. He looked over to his stepdaughter and he remembered just how calm she was. She just had a blank expression on her face. She was watching her mother essentially torturing this man and she wasn't crying. She wasn't shouting or getting upset or angry. She was just so calm. It was like this extreme level of violence didn't phase her at all. She wasn't disturbed or traumatised or anything like most kids and adults would be if they were to witness this. But I mean, you have to remember for Sharon, this was basically the norm. It was normal for her to witness these violent outbursts from her mother. So it had clearly gotten to the point where it didn't even make her flinch anymore. She had grown up never really knowing any different. Sharon started experimenting with drugs at a very young age. It's been reported that at just 11 years old, she started smoking cannabis. And as well as being violent towards the other kids at school, she also started to become violent towards animals. Sharon Carr started torturing and killing animals because she got enjoyment out of it. This child enjoyed inflicting pain on defenseless animals. Apparently, a lot of pets in her neighbourhood just suddenly started going missing and some of these pets would eventually be found dead. However, they hadn't died of like an accident or natural causes. They had been horrifically murdered. In fact, one of Sharon's neighbour's dogs, this part is very graphic by the way, so a pre-warning in case you want to skip ahead, but one of the neighbour's dogs was found decapitated. It had been decapitated with a spade and it's believed that the person who did that was Sharon Carr. It's been reported that she also used to enjoy torturing cats and also frying live hamsters. It seemed as though she would literally go out hunting for animals and pets that she could kidnap and then kill. Although it was never officially proven that Sharon Carr was the one who was doing this, who was killing all of these pets, pretty much everyone in the local area believed that it was her because she had such a bad reputation on the estate where she and her family lived. They lived on the the old Dean estate in Camberley and everyone on the estate knew that Sharon Carr was bad news. Everyone knew that she was not someone to be messed with. They knew that she was quick to anger and that she was aggressive and violent and her neighbours were terrified of her. Grown adults were scared of this child. That's how terrifying Sharon's behaviour was. As I mentioned, she terrified the kids in her school. She would bully them and threaten them and she even took weapons to school with her. 
up. She would put knives and sharp objects in her school bag and her behaviour was picked up on by the teachers and in 1990 the head teacher of the school got in touch with social services because it was clear that the way Sharon was behaving at school probably had something to do with her life at home. It was clear that she did not have a good home life at all and so the head teacher got in touch with social services and as a result of this Sharon was taken away and she was put into foster care although only for about a month or so. After just weeks she was sent home. I don't know why or how. Seems like a huge mistake from social services there. I don't know how they could have possibly come to the conclusion that Sharon's home was a good and safe environment for a child. But yeah, after about a month she was sent back and life carried on as normal for Sharon. She kept up with her bad reputation. She was still subjected to her mother's violent outbursts at home. She was still a menace at school. She was still feared by neighbours because they believed that she was going around torturing and killing the local pets. However, by the summer of 1992, so by this point Sharon would have been 12 years old, by the summer of 1992 Sharon's violent character would just escalate completely. It almost seems like she was bored. She was bored of just bullying and pushing kids around. She was bored of killing animals. That wasn't exciting enough for her anymore. She wanted to step it up. She wanted to do something that she had never done before. She wanted to commit her most heinous crime yet. 12 year old Sharon Carr decided that she wanted to commit murder. She wanted to kill a human being. The date was the 6th of June 1992 and that evening Evening, a young woman named Katie Ratcliffe was out with a friend at a nightclub in Camberley in Surrey. But before we really go into that evening, let me just tell you a little bit more about Katie, about who she was. So Katie Ratcliffe was 18 years old at the time that this case took place. Her parents were called Joseph and Helen Ratcliffe and she also had a sister called Joanne. She may have had more siblings but I could only find information about one about Joanne online so I think she was one of two children. The the Ratcliffe family lived in a town called Hawley in Surrey and Katie was described by those that knew her as just being a very nice kind young girl. She was bubbly, she was popular, she had several friends and this time of her life was very exciting for her because she was 18 years old so she wasn't in school anymore and she had just started her career. Katie was working as a trainee hairdresser at a salon and she really enjoyed her job. She was enjoying learning about hairdressing and developing her skills and she enjoyed working with her colleagues at the salon. Her old boss at the salon said that Katie was really starting to blossom in her work. She had such a promising career ahead of her as a hairdresser. However, her career, her entire future in fact, was cruelly snatched away from her when Katie was brutally murdered in 1992. So as I said, on the evening of the 6th of June 1992, Katie Ratcliffe had decided to go on a night out with a friend of hers in Camberley. The reason they decided to go out actually was because Katie was feeling quite low and down at the time. She'd been having some issues with her boyfriend. I think they'd actually broken up. So Katie was obviously quite upset and so she and her friend decided that it would be good for her to get out of the house and have a night out, have some fun to distract her. And so they got all ready, they got all dressed up and they went to a nightclub in Camberley called Ragamuffins. As far as I'm aware, Katie had a good night and when the club closed in the early hours of the next morning, in the early hours of the 7th of June, Katie left and she started to make her way home. Now Katie was walking alone towards her home. I'm not sure what happened to her friend, whether they got separated or perhaps she lived in a different direction, so she was walking along another route, but Katie was on her own walking along the road in the middle of the night and it was during her walk home when she encountered 12 year old Sharon Carr. Now it's not known Known exactly what happened that night, the exact version of events. So the account that I'm about to tell you is what the police have theorised happened based on the account that they would receive from Sharon years later and also other evidence. Now some sources state that Sharon, despite being only 12 years old, despite being a child, apparently she was a regular at the Rag and Muffins nightclub. How she managed to get in I don't know. But some sources seem to suggest that she was also there that evening 
evening and then later that night the police believe that she was in a car with two men. The names of these men are not public but it's believed that she was in the car with these two men who were associates of hers. They were driving around Camberley and Sharon was armed with a knife. She had a knife with her that night and in the early hours of the 7th of June as they were driving around Sharon spotted 18 year old Katie Ratcliffe walking alone along the road as we know she was on her way home. Sharon didn't know Katie, she was a stranger to her but it's believed that when Sharon saw her she decided that she was going to attack and kill her. It's theorised that they pulled up alongside Katie, she got in the car, she either got in willingly, maybe they offered her a lift home and she accepted or Sharon and the two men forced her into the car and Katie never made it home that night. She was never seen alive again. That night, she was brutally murdered by Sharon Carr. Sharon had claimed her first murder victim. Katie's lifeless body was found later that same morning, about five hours after it's believed she had been attacked and killed. She was discovered just dumped on the side of a road in Farnborough, which is roughly three to four miles away from where she disappeared in Camberley. She was found by a group of young boys who called the police and the way in which Katie had been murdered was just horrendous. She had been tortured. Her killer, who as we know was Sharon, clearly wanted her to suffer in her final moments. She was kind of half naked when she was found. Her blood-soaked clothes were in disarray. She had stab wounds all over her body. She had been stabbed with a knife numerous times and this knife was estimated to be about six and a half inches long. She had stab wounds in her chest, in her head and some of these stab wounds were so vicious. They had been in inflicted with so much force that they literally went all the way through her body. She had entry and exit wounds from where the knife had been plunged all the way through her. The knife had punctured her ribs, her heart, she had stab wounds to her genitalia. Her genitalia had just been mutilated. She had been stabbed at least 27 times and the pathologist actually determined that some of these injuries had been inflicted post-mortem. So even after Katie was dead, the attack did not stop. Sharon just kept going and going and going. This was such a frenzied killing. So following the discovery of Katie's body, obviously after she was identified, her poor family were informed of her tragic death and inquiries immediately began to try and track down the killer, track down the monster that did this to her. Katie's parents and her sister Joanne attended a press conference in which they pleaded for the public's help in finding the killer. They pleaded for anyone with any information to please Please come forward to the police. Police were looking into various different leads, they were making inquiries and speaking to the people who went to Ragamuffins, the nightclub, on the same night that Katie was there. They were doing everything, everything that they could to try and find the murderer. But the issue was, they were looking for a man not a woman, not a child killer. The detectives felt that the evidence and the facts of this case indicated that the killer had to be a male because it seemed as though Katie's murder had a sexual motive behind it. As we know, she was semi-naked when she was found and her genitals had just been mutilated. So they believed that the person they were looking for was a man, an adult man. They had this almost tunnel vision mentality where they were only looking for a man, which to be fair, I think is under understandable. I think most people would assume that the killer in this case was a man given the injuries that Katie had. Let's be honest, no one, absolutely no one would have thought that a 12 year old girl could have been responsible for this horrific murder. So yeah, the police were only looking into men. They were only questioning men. They even made a photo fit of a man that they were interested in speaking to in relation to this case. I'm not sure what or who exactly this photo fit is based on. Perhaps it was of a guy who was seen in the club that night or near the area where Katie was last seen, who knows. And of course the police never found the man responsible for Katie's murder. They were never able to definitively link any man to the crime because it wasn't a man who did it. And over time Katie Ratcliffe's case went cold and Sharon Carr had gotten away with it. At just 12 years old it seemed as though she had gotten away with murder. And she wrote all 
all about it in her diary. She wrote all about Katie's murder and how it made her feel. She referred to Katie as KR a lot in these diary entries, KR obviously being Katie's initials. And I have some quotes from her diary entries here. These are some of the things that she wrote in the months and years after Katie's death. In one entry, she wrote, quote, I enjoyed putting the blade up her. It made me feel powerful. Another quote from her diary, she wrote, I'm a killer. Killing is my business and business is good. Oh damn, I've got a taste for red rum and God, I want to get drunk. She also wrote, quote, last night it occurred to me that killing her did me good. Now I know what I'm capable of and I will do it again. And in another diary entry, Sharon wrote, quote, I was born to be a murderer. Killing for me is a mass turn on and it just makes me so high I never want to come down. Every night I see the devil in my dreams, sometimes even in my mirror, but I realise it was just me. And that is honestly just a few of them. There are more entries she made about Katie's murder. She also drew graphic pictures in her diaries, I think. She drew a picture of a knife, the same weapon that we know Katie was killed with. And these diary entries obviously show us Sharon's state of mind in the aftermath of the crime. She wasn't at all feeling any guilt or remorse or disgust at what she had done. Clearly, she felt the complete opposite. She relished in it. She had enjoyed killing Katie. She literally said that it made her feel powerful. So powerful, in fact, that she wanted to do it again. She wanted to get that feeling, that adrenaline rush that Katie's murder gave her. She wanted that again. And of course, because the police investigating Katie's murder was still exclusively looking for a man she was free to do it again. She was free to target someone else. And that is exactly what she did two years after Katie's murder in June of 1994. It was actually exactly on the two year anniversary of Katie's murder when Sharon decided to strike again. It was two years to the day, the 7th of June, 1994. And I'm sure that that was no coincidence. Sharon probably wanted to celebrate the two year anniversary of her first murder by carrying out a second attack by trying to claim her next murder victim. By this point, obviously, she was two years older. She was 14 years old. And that day, the 7th of June, 1994, Sharon was at school. She attended the Collingwood College Comprehensive School in Surrey. And at some point during the school day, Sharon lured another student, 13-year-old Anne-Marie Clifford, into the girls' toilets. Sharon asked Anne-Marie if she could come into the toilets with her to help her look for a pound coin that she had lost in there and to be honest Anne-Marie was way too scared to say no. I mean I've mentioned a few times in this video that Sharon Carr was a bully in school. She could be very aggressive and violent to the other kids and most of them were terrified of her. So when Sharon asked Anne-Marie to help her look for this pound coin she was worried about what Sharon might do, how she might react if she refused and so she said yeah okay I'll help you. However of course this wasn't Sharon's plan. She didn't want Anne-Marie to come into the bathroom to help her look for some money. She wanted her to come in so that she could attack her. And as soon as Anne-Marie was in the bathroom, that is exactly what she proceeded to do. She pulled out a four-inch knife, which she brought to school with her. She went up behind Anne-Marie and she plunged the knife into her back. And this stab wound was so deep that it punctured Anne-Marie's lung. Anne-Marie Marie obviously fell to the ground and when she looked up at her attacker, at Sharon, who was standing over her, she saw Sharon smiling. She had the blood-soaked knife in her hand and she was smiling because, again, this was enjoyable for her. Now, luckily, literally as the attack was happening, before Sharon could stab Anne-Marie again, a group of girls walked into the toilets. They saw what was going on in there and teachers were alerted and emergency services were immediately called to the scene. Anne-Marie was taken to the hospital and thankfully she survived the attack. She was very lucky to survive the attack. It's believed that had those girls not come into the bathroom when they did, she probably 
probably would have died because the stab wound was so, so deep. She had sustained a very severe life-threatening injury. Thankfully, doctors managed to save her and I believe eventually she made a full recovery. A full recovery physically, anyway. I mean, I cannot imagine how badly this must have affected Anne-Marie mentally, how much trauma she was left with after the attack. According to a documentary that I watched about this case, she did have horrendous nightmares after what had happened to her, to the point where her father had to sleep in her bedroom with her for so long afterwards because she just couldn't be on her own at night. She was just too terrified. She was scared that Sharon Carr was somehow going to come back to her and try again, try and finish her off this time. But Sharon Carr had failed. Her attempt to kill Amory Clifford was unsuccessful and as soon as police arrived at the scene that day, she was arrested. Following her arrest, Sharon was taken to a medical assessment centre and it was there where she actually tried to attack two more people. She tried to literally strangle two nurses who worked at the centre. So I think as well as being charged with the attack of Anne-Marie Clifford, she was also charged with two counts of actual bodily harm for trying to strangle the two members of staff. But she was convicted of those charges in late 1994 and she was ordered to serve two years in a young offenders institution in Essex called HM Bullwood Hall. However, during her time in the Young Offenders Institution, Sharon just couldn't keep her mouth shut about the crimes that she had committed, specifically about the murder of Katie Ratcliffe, which obviously happened a couple of years earlier in 1992. A crime which, as we know, she still hadn't been caught for yet. At this point in time, it still remained unsolved for the police, but not for much longer, because, as I just said, Sharon could not shut up about it. She basically began bragging about Katie's murder to various different people. She would tell friends and family about it on the phone. She would brag to the other inmates at the Young Offenders Institution. She even bragged about it to the staff at the institution. She told a prison officer and a probation officer about what she had done, the murder that she had committed. Because to her, this was something to be proud of. This wasn't something that she wanted to keep hidden from people. She wanted people to know that she was a killer. I imagine because she wanted that notoriety. She wanted people to fear her. She was also continuing to write in her diaries about the murder in one entry from 1996. So while she was in the Young Offenders Institution, she wrote, I bring the knife into her chest. Her eyes are closing. She is pleading with me, so I bring the knife to her again and again. I don't want to hurt her, but I need to do violence to her. I need to overcome her beauty, her serenity, her security. There I see her face when she died. I know she feels her life being slowly drawn from her and I hear her gasp. I guess she was trying to breathe. The air stops in the back of her throat. I know all her life her breathing has worked but it does not now and I am joyful. So because of all of these statements she was making to various people about Katie's murder, the staff at the Young Offenders Institution got in touch with the police. So detectives sat down with Sharon and they interviewed her and incredibly she didn't deny it even to the police. She straight up confessed to being Katie's killer and the police knew that she was telling the truth. They knew that this wasn't a false confession because as Sharon was confessing, she was able to give them details about the murder that had not been released to the public. Details that only Katie Ratcliffe's killer could have known. For example, she gave very graphic details about how she attacked Katie, where exactly she had stabbed her and these kinds of details about her injury were not public knowledge and she also confessed to the police that after Katie was dead she stole from her victim. She took her bracelet and Katie's bracelet was missing when her body was found and again this information about the bracelet had not been released by the police. Only the killer could have known that Katie's bracelet had been taken so they knew from this confession that Sharon was telling the truth. She really was the murderer that they had been looking for for years now. And I cannot imagine just how shocked the detectives must have been when they realised that the person they were looking for all along was not an adult man, but in fact a young teenage 
girl, a child. And it wasn't just Sharon's confession which proved to them that she was the killer. As part of their investigation into Sharon, they had a look through her belongings to see what other evidence they could find. And when they searched her home on the old Dean estate in Camberley, where she obviously lived with her family before being sent to the Young Offenders Institution, they found all of her old diaries where she wrote in detail about Katie's murder, where she wrote about how much she enjoyed killing Katie. So the police had a substantial amount to say that Sharon was the perpetrator. They had the diaries, they had the details given by Sharon which matched up with the crime. They had her confession. Sharon was interviewed about the murder at length numerous times and although there were little inconsistencies in her story occasionally, on the whole it was basically the same and in each version of events that she gave the police she admitted that she had stabbed Katie repeatedly with the knife. She also told the police about the two men who who were in the car with her that night when they picked Katie up. As I mentioned earlier, they were apparently associates of Sharon's and she was able to give the police their names. Unfortunately, we don't know their names because that information has always been withheld by the police, but Sharon gave their names over and according to sources, she actually claimed that the two men had engaged in sexual activity with Katie while she was in the backseat of the car, I think before she was attacked and murdered. So these two men were both arrested and questioned. However, they both denied it. They both actually gave each other an alibi and claimed that they weren't even there that night, that they weren't with Sharon Carr. The police continued investigating them anyway. They tried to find evidence that linked them to the crime. However, they were unsuccessful. They could never find solid concrete evidence which implicated them and so they were never able to charge them. They were released without charge. But to be honest, I think even to this day, people still believe that that those men were lying, that they were involved in what happened to Katie that night. It's not believed that they were necessarily involved in the murder, it is believed that Sharon was the one who actually carried out the killing, who stabbed Katie. She did that part. Where exactly she did it, I'm not sure. I don't know if she killed Katie in the car or maybe in a remote quiet area outside before taking her body to Farnborough. But yeah, it's not necessarily thought that the two men were involved in the stabbing aspect of the crime. However, you have to remember that Sharon was just 12 years old at the time of Katie's death and Katie was 18. She was an adult. It seems unlikely that a child would have been able to overpower Katie on her own. Would she really have had the strength to uh, like drag her and hold her down and stab Katie without another person or two people helping her? Also, another reason why people still strongly believe that these two men were involved was because obviously Katie's body was found dumped on the side of a road in Farnborough, but we know that she disappeared from Camberley after leaving the Ragamuffins nightclub. She was abducted from Camberley and killed, and how could Sharon have gotten Katie's body from Camberley to Farnborough on her own. She had to have had a car to do that, but obviously she was 12. She didn't own a car, she didn't drive, so she must have had people helping her. That's the main reason why the majority of people believe that these men were involved in the crime, but as I said, the police just did not have the solid evidence to prove it, so they were eventually let go. But they did have the evidence against Sharon, and in May of 1996, just under four years after the crime, Sharon Carr was charged with the murder of Katie Ratcliffe. And just the month following this, on the 7th of June 1996, the four-year anniversary of Katie's murder, Sharon wrote in her diary, quote, respect to Katie Ratcliffe, four years today. Now, given the fact that Sharon had literally confessed, it was looking like this was a pretty clean-cut case. She'd admitted it, so she would plead guilty and then she would just have to be sentenced. But that is is not what happened because while she was in custody she actually took back her confession. Despite having previously admitted it, she was now claiming that she wasn't actually the killer. It's believed that her legal team probably told her to do that. I think she was basically claiming that she only said that she was the killer because she was very mentally unstable at the time that she gave the confession, which I mean was true. Sharon was very very mentally ill. After she was arrested 
period she was examined by doctors and psychiatrists and it was determined that she was suffering from schizoaffective disorder. She was diagnosed with that and schizoaffective disorder is a combination of schizophrenia and a mood disorder. So Sharon was experiencing the symptoms of schizophrenia such as you know psychosis, delusions, paranoia etc. But alongside that she was also suffering with a mood disorder such as depression and mania. She may have also been suffering from bipolar and I believe it was determined that she also had multiple borderline antisocial personality disorder too. So she was very mentally ill however despite that and despite her trying to take back her confession the evidence still pointed to the fact that she was Katie's killer and so the charge remained and Sharon Carr was headed to trial. Her trial began in early 1997 and from what I can gather Sharon's defence team were trying to persuade the jury to convict her of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility rather than murder. They claimed that due to her mental illnesses she could not be held responsible for her actions whereas the prosecution were obviously hoping that the jury would find her guilty of murder. During the trial the jury were shown Sharon's confessions which she gave police when she was first arrested. They were shown her diary entries where she talked about the murder in detail and how she got a buzz from it and when the trial came to a close on the 25th of March 1997 after five hours of deliberation the jury returned with their verdict. Ultimately they agreed with the prosecution and they found her guilty of murder, the murder of Katie Ratcliffe. Whilst it was clear that Sharon did have severe mental health issues the jury believed that ultimately she was responsible for her actions. She was in control of what she did and didn't do so she was convicted of murder rather than manslaughter. At her sentencing she was ordered to serve 14 years in prison. I'm guessing her age at the time of the murder was taken into account when deciding this sentence as it is quite low. Although having said that the judge did pass a recommendation that Sharon Carr should probably be detained indefinitely due to the danger that she posed to the public. Whilst he was passing the sentence the judge also said quote what is clear is that you had a sexual motive for this killing and it is apparent both from the brutal manner in which you mutilated her body and chilling entries in your diary that killing as you put it turned you on. You are in my view an extremely dangerous young woman. Her murder conviction actually earned Sharon Carr the title of the youngest female murderer in British history. Mary Bell is the only female in Britain who was younger than Sharon Carr at the time of her crimes. Obviously as we know Sharon was 12 when she killed Katie Ratcliffe but Mary Bell was just 10, 10 years old when she killed two little boys in 1968. Martin Brown who was four years old and Brian Howe who was just three. I have covered the Mary Bell case on my channel before a couple of years ago now I think so I'll link that down below in case you want to watch it. But the reason Sharon Carr is officially Britain's youngest female murderer ever and not Mary is because Mary was convicted of manslaughter rather than murder. So Mary is considered Britain's youngest female killer whereas Sharon is considered Britain's youngest female murderer. Following her conviction and sentence Sharon Carr was first taken to HM Prison Holloway in London. However due to her mental state she was later transferred to Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital. She was transferred there in 1998 and she caused a lot of trouble during her time in Broadmoor. She continued to be very very violent towards other inmates and patients. She expressed how she wanted to murder one particular inmate by slitting their throat. She attacked staff. She began hurting herself because according to one source she convinced herself that she was a lizard and so she started trying to cut herself to find out if that was true or if she was still human. Bizarrely she also got engaged during her time at Broadmoor. In 2001 it was reported in the media that she had fallen in love with another inmate named Robbie Lane. He was in Broadmoor because he murdered his own mother. He beat her to death and gouged her eyes out of the sockets. So he was sent to Broadmoor where he met and fell in love with Sharon Carr. They got engaged. However, the wedding was cancelled when both of them learned about the other's crimes. Prior to getting engaged, neither of them knew why the other was in Broadmoor. Sharon didn't know that Robbie 
had killed his mother and Robbie didn't know that Sharon had killed 18 year old Katie Ratcliffe and apparently after their engagement they found out what the other had done and suddenly neither of them wanted to go through with it despite having both committed the same crime, having both committed murder, they were disgusted at the other and they didn't want to marry in the end. So the wedding was called off and a couple of years after this in 2004 Sharon Carr tried to appeal against her conviction. Her and her defence team launched an appeal to try and now change her murder conviction to one of manslaughter but this was unsuccessful. A few years after this in 2007 Sharon was moved from Broadmoor Hospital to another the psychiatric unit because I believe it was in 2007 when Broadmoor became a male only psychiatric hospital so Sharon was sent elsewhere and then in 2015 she was transferred to a proper prison she was sent to HM prison Bronzefield which I believe is where she still is today in 2023. Today she is about 43 years old and obviously her 14 year sentence is up now that ended years ago but she is still in prison because because she is still considered a very very dangerous person, a high risk to the public and I personally don't see her being released anytime soon. I do think it is very likely that she will spend the rest of her life in prison. But that is it for this case. That is the case of the youngest female murderer in British history, Sharon Carr. My heart goes out to the Ratcliffe family, Katie's loved ones. I cannot imagine how devastating and traumatising it must have been for them to lose her in this way. A truly wild case. Cases like this where children are the perpetrators always just terrify me so much. It's so scary to think that a 12 year old girl can be capable of committing such a brutal murder. This is such an infamous UK case because of that, because of the fact that Sharon was so so young when she did this. It just shocked everyone because obviously cases like this are so incredibly rare. I'm just glad that Sharon Carr was caught when she was because if she hadn't been apprehended after the attack on Anne-Marie Clifford, then there is no doubt in my mind that she would have gone on to become a serial killer. That's clearly what she wanted. That was her intention. But yeah, that is it for this case. As always, please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on this case in the comments. I really want to hear what you guys think. Also, feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another Mystery with Molly.